Hey everybody, Matt from 90thPercentile.ca here. For access to more study notes, practice questions, mock exams, and end chapter question videos, visit 90thPercentile.ca and sign up for your free trial today. Link below in the description. This learning module is capital structure. In my opinion, it's kind of a, it's not structured this way in the book, but I look at it as a summary of the last three or four modules that we went over. There's not really <clears throat> any new concepts in here. It's just, you know, going over some examples and with all the examples and scenarios that were presented here on the left, in every case, we're looking at how it impacts the capital structure decisions of companies. So for those factors, we're going to look at company life cycles. So whether companies in its growth stage, mature stage, how that's going to impact what kind of capital it can attract. We're also going to be talking about financing costs, the different costs associated with equity and debt and how this shapes what type of financing the company looks for in its target capital structure as well as a capital structure for indi individual projects. We're also going to discuss how the market value and book value of especially equity changes. Um, so the book value being the carrying value on the balance sheet, but the market value being like the market value of a publicly traded stock. So we'll look at how, who mainly looks at these differences. Um, and why these differences between market and, and book value can be relevant for their capital structure. And kind of touched on this already, but we'll be looking at how arranging financing for specific projects impacts the consolidated company's capital structure. And then finally, we'll get introduced to one quick theory called pecking order theory, which is used, well, as a theory um, to tell companies which source of financing they should uh draw on first relative to others. So with that, let's jump into the questions. Which of the following is true of the growth stage in a company's development? A, cash flow is negative by definition with investment outlays exceeding cash flow from ops. No, in the growth stage, typically, you know, we're already past the startup phase in the company. Should be having some, you know, revenue coming in um, and it's just expanding its operations. And I mean, I don't even like the wording here. Cash flow is negative by definition. No, it's even in the startup phase, it's not 100% certain that cash flow will be negative. But, you know, anyway, B, cash flow may either be negative or positive. Yes, this is true. Um, and then C, cash flow is positive and growing quickly. You don't really know that. Like I said, it depends on what's going on in the company. So B is our answer. Next, which of the following is most likely to occur as a company evolves from growth stage to maturity and seeks to optimize its capital structure? A, the company relies on equity to finance its growth. No, typically they'll rely on debt as the company matures. And there's a couple of reasons for this. One, um, they actually have the ability to repay the debt. And this includes interest and principal repayments because you know, they're going from growth to maturity, so they should have some significant or at least, uh, you know, enough cash flows from ops to, to service its debt. Also, debt is cheaper. Debt is cheaper than equity. You'll notice in the, even in the previous learning module that we looked at, the cost of debt, whether it's before tax or after tax, is pretty much always um, cheaper than the, the required rate of return on equity or cost of equity. And really the, you know, inherent assumption is that that is always cheaper than equity. And that's because you're not given, giving up a ownership stake in your company. And then three, uh, this would also be like the company relying more on equity than debt is, is more applicable to startups who might not even have any revenue coming in. They might just have like an idea. So here's where, where angel investors and venture capital firms will make an investment in return for a equity ownership in the, com in the company. Next, leverage increases as the company needs more cap capital to support organic expansion. Um, the, you know, we'll leave that one on hold for now, go to C. Leverage increases as the company is able to support more debt. Yeah, so this kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about its ability to repay debt is more than it was previously. Um, here, typically leverage increases, but 
there could also be like, like the thing that threw me off here was the organic expansion. Hopefully as a company goes from growth to maturity, it has enough cash from ops to fund organic expansion. Whereas leverage is typically used. So getting debt is usually for inorganic expansion. So, you know, acquiring companies. The weighted average cost of capital or WAC for this company is 10%. The company announces a debt offering that raises the WAC to 13%. The most likely conclusion is that for the company, the company's prospects are improving. Well, no, because now we have a higher WAC or hired average return on all of its capital. So no. B, equity financing is cheaper than debt financing. <clears throat> Once again, this is very, very unlikely. Um, the real answer is that the company's debt to equity has moved beyond its optimal range. So you can use like a little example here. We're not going to toss in the weights because like it's just an example. We don't have to over, over complicate it. But let's say that a company's, the cost of debt is like 6% and the cost of equity is like 15%. So, so that this is like their original so this is PY or prior year um, and now current year. And, and, you know, if you were to multiply these using some weights, just assume that we get the 10% that they're stating. And then, then they raise a bunch of debt and their combined rate is now 13%, their combined WAC. So there's a couple of things that could have happened. One, their cost of debt could have, like, their average cost of debt could have gone up because now they have more debt on their books. So they might be at like 7% now. And because they have more debt on their books, because of this, because they're more leveraged, now the return on equity is also higher, maybe like 17%. And then if you average these out, then you get to the 13. Um, so like raising a lot of debt has, has two impacts. One, they might have to raise or raise this new debt at higher interest rates to, you know, compensate investors for taking that additional risk with uh, like other additional debt on the balance sheet already. And the higher leverage increases the return on equity as well. Which of the following is least accurate with respect to debt equity conflicts? So the conflicts of interest between equity holders and debt holders. You kind of went over this in, uh, the corporate governance module but here it is again so what is least accurate equity holders focus on potential upside and downside outcomes while debt holders focus primarily on downside risk this is true so it's incorrect um, equity holders of course you know their return can be many multiples of what they actually invested or they could lose everything so that's the upside and the downside while debt holders only focus on the downside risk because their upside is capped at their interest rate plus the uh, repayment of principal Moving on, B, management attempts to balance the interests of equity holders and debt holders. Well, not really. Um, and once again, that's why least accurate is, is the terminology here. Uh, like, of course, it depends on the company, but generally management doesn't really have the interests of debt holders in mind. That might be kind of a stretch, but... At the end of the day, they have their interest, they have their debt, and they got to repay their principal and adhere to the covenants, and that's it. Whereas, especially if management has comp tied to the company performance, then their interests are more aligned with equity holders and debt holders. <clears throat> we can look at C as well. Debt covenants can mitigate the conflict between debt holders and equity holders. They uh, like they can, but not really. The debt covenants would have to be really, really strict to have interests aligned between equity holders and debt holders like at that point the debt may as well be, be convertible into common stocks that's really the only way that um debt holders and equity holders can have their interests completely aligned is if they're both equity holders which of the following is least likely to be true with respect to agency costs and senior management compensation so agency costs, once again, are just costs that arise from conflicts of interest between principals and agents. So what's the least likely regarding agency costs and senior management comp? Okay. Equity-based incentive comp is a primary method to address the problem of agency costs. 
this is true. Um, I might not say primary method, but it's true enough that that I wouldn't include it. Um, if management is receiving equity based or like share based comp as part of their their compensation structure, then generally they're going to be aligned with the interests of equity holders. B a well designed compensation scheme should eliminate agency costs. Well, no, it's not going to completely eliminate it. It completely depends on the compensation scheme, but it's not going to, nothing will ever be completely eliminated just based on comp. There's always going to be some incentive to do something in your interest. Which of the following is least accurate with respect to the market value and book value of a company's equity? A, market value is more relevant than book value when comparing a company's cost of capital. This is correct, so this is not the answer. Um, the reason behind this, you know, a company might issue shares at a book value of like 10 bucks per share like 20 years ago, <laughs> but now the market value has them at, let's say, 200. So obviously this 10 bucks isn't that relevant anymore. So moving on, book value is often used by lenders and in financial ratio calculations. Yeah, this is, this is true as well. Um, book value especially for from the lenders perspective it mainly the lenders take a more conservative approach when using financial ratios when they're giving out debt to a company so despite you know maybe a big difference in market value and book value they, they kind of look at it as like a worst worst case scenario where okay if this company goes bankrupt like what can i actually get for sure or with almost certainty what can i get for their equity as collateral um that's kind of what they're thinking and then both market value and book value fluctuate with changes in the company share price uh this is not accurate so it's the answer the book value will stay the same but the market value will change just how i displayed here which of the following is not a reason why target capital structure and actual capital structure tend to differ a financing is often tied to a specific investment um, so this is a reason why capital structure and actual capital structure tend to differ. So it's not the answer. Like typically for, I don't know if you're building a factory, um, the bank will not decide your capital structure, but it'll give you like a maximum lending amount. And then you're going to have to, you know, figure out the rest where, where the rest of the equity financing is coming from, either from cash from ops, new investors, etc. cetera. Um, so this is not the answer. B Companies tend to, uh, companies raise capital when the terms are attractive. This is for sure a reason. Um, great example of this over the last, call it like just before COVID, you would have seen the IPO market be really, really, really hot for a year and a half, two years with all these like high growth tech stocks, growing revenues of like five, 600% a year, but no earnings. And, you know, they were all IPOing and getting crazy valuations at like eight times revenue. Um, so management's, they're, they're not stupid, right? They know what they're doing. They're going to raise capital when the market terms are attractive and they're getting a good valuation in terms of, you know, where those stock prices are now, they're, a lot of them are not doing so hot to say the least, but, um, you know, they, they did a good job of, of raising capital when they needed to. And then finally. Target capital capital structure is set for a particular project, while actual capital structure is me is measured at the cap uh, consolidated company level. No, so it's the opposite. Target capital structure is at the consolidated level, and actual uh, actual capital structure is for a particular project. So it's the opposite. Vega Company has announced that it intends to raise capital next year, but it is unsure as to the appropriate method of raising capital. CFOs concluded that Vega should apply pecking order theory to determine the appropriate method of raising capital. Based on White's conclusion, they should raise capital in the following order. Then we have either internal financing, debt, or equity. So pecking order theory basically says um, that managers should choose methods of, of financing in a way that gives first preference to, to financing methods that have the least information asymmetry. And that's kind of a complicated way of saying um that the less information they have to share related to a specific source of capital they should just use that one first so the answer is actually internal financing first because 
internal financing is like cash from operations. You don't have to share, like it's your own money. You don't have to share information with anybody to get to get that money. And then you have debt. So debt debt holders are, you know, there the, there is some information that, that you have to share to get debt, but it's not as strict as information related to an equity offering, such as an IPO. Um, like when you're trying to raise debt, typically you'll just give, like for a specific project, you'll give, you know, your projected cash flows for, um, for the project, you might get some, like depending on the project, you might get some appraisals for the asset value if they're used as collateral, all of that stuff. But you don't need like a full in-depth audit of your entire company. Whereas for an IPO and, you know, public, publicly listed shares or publicly listed shares, then you're going to have a lot more information you have to give out to get that equity. And peck and order, peck and order theory basically says that as information asymmetry increases, then your weighted average cost of capital is going to increase as well. So information asymmetry, meaning that there's an imbalance of information between two parties. So like management obviously has the most information related to day-to-day -day ops, while equity holders, even though they have an interest in the, in the company, they don't know what's going on uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So there's a big gap in, in information between the two parties. And due to that, your cost of capital is just going to keep increasing.